The category for Final Jeopardy today is Needless Analysis of Classic Game Shows. Here's the clue. Jeopardy champ James Holtzauer won 32 matches and broke the game of Jeopardy using this secret method. Wait, he had a strategy? I thought he was just a robot. Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that gives you your daily double of pop culture and incisive research. Most of the time on Film Theory, I cover movies and shows that really capture the imagination. Marvel superheroes, Disney's dark side, internet creepypastas, but today I'm going back to my roots. That's right, I'm talking about game shows. For really the first time since I tried it like eight years ago on a one-off episode of Game Theory where I'm like, here, let's talk about these games in this game show, and everyone was like, these are video games and I'm like yeah but they're games in a game show format actually probably more useful because I could teach you how to win tens of thousands of dollars on like the price is right and everyone's like no that sucks and I'm like all right well I guess I don't get to talk about that thing that I really like to talk about so bottle it up inside Matt Pat bottle it up inside until today and in a part two episode that will undoubtedly underperform on this channel but you know what I just thought it was really interesting because Jeopardy is rigged anyway rant over over, back to my pre-scripted intro. Game shows were one of my earliest TV loves. Little Matt Pat spent many a day curled up in front of the glow of Wheel of Fortune, Price is Right especially, and the king of them all, Jeopardy. Now, I know that not many of you watch Jeopardy because, let's face it, not many of you are over 75, but Jeopardy is having a huge cultural resurgence. I mean, first off, Netflix just picked up, like, every episode of Jeopardy ever created because people were just really excited to watch Jeopardy on Netflix for some reason. But also, and more importantly, because NBC's 7 p.m. grandma bait has been playing out like a telenovela of the game show world over the past year. Picture this, professional sports better James comes onto Jeopardy for the first time on April 4th, 2019. No one knows that he's taken a full year off to study and prepare for these games. He comes in, completely upends how the entire game of Jeopardy is played, and wins over the audiences with his bold and weirdly charming yet robotic social awkwardness. He goes on to win 32 games in a row, and even Alex Trebek feels badly for people who have to play against him. He breaks every Jeopardy high score record known to mankind since the show began in 1964, single-handedly redefining what it meant to win big on a TV game show with a total payout of $2,462,216. Who wants to be a millionaire? Eat your heart out. He wanted to be a millionaire twice over and did it. He he accomplishes this massive total by averaging, get this, $76,944 of winning every single game. The previous single day scoring record for a game of Jeopardy was $77,000, a record that James himself broke 16 times during the course of his run. But just as he's one game away from breaking that all-time earnings record of Jeopardy, taking over the crown held by the famous Ken Jennings himself, who did it in over 70 games. Games, he is suddenly unceremoniously sniped by a research librarian. The story leaves us with two main questions. One, how the heck did James manage to reinvent Jeopardy, a game show that's been running for the better part of a century? And two, was he really defeated? Or did NBC rig the game to make sure that he was kicked off before he basically bankrupted the show? Did James just have a lucky run with an unlucky ending? Or was there a lot more going on here behind the scenes than all the Jeopardy viewers could see through their heavily bifocal lenses. Get ready, my friends, because at the end of this two-part series, we might just have exposed the greatest conspiracy to ever happen in game show history. Final Jeopardy, indeed. Let's talk about James's strategy first. There's been a lot of Jeopardy contestants over the years, and if you've watched the show, you know that 99% of players play in a very low-risk way. As a refresher, on Jeopardy, you have five trivia categories with five questions each, and the questions get harder as you go down each column. You 
pick which category and dollar amount that you want to go for. Get the question right, get the money, choose again, get it wrong, and lose the money. Because losing money is an option in this game, most players tend to bet pretty conservatively at first, testing out the category by picking the easy, low-value questions first. Except for James. He was one of the first players ever to take the completely opposite approach. First, he almost always started at the highest valued clues way down at the bottom of the board, and then he would move his way up to the smaller numbers. This allowed him to get ahead fast very early on, not only racking up his own score, but also keeping the other players from catching up because all the high value questions were already taken. Next, he also jumped from category to category. Now, most people will find a category that they're comfortable with and then try to run through all the questions in it. This makes sense because instead of switching from one topic to the next, you can think all the way through a category and hopefully answer all the questions right. But rather than let his opponents get into a groove on a specific topic, James forced them to jump from pop music to European history to rhyme time, a method that seemed to work for him but often discombobulated his opponents. James has said in interviews that he used children's books to study facts about everything from pop culture to geography, practiced quizzing himself across a huge range of subjects, giving himself the flexibility to hop from category to category while his opponents were still trying to remember that European capital city from two questions ago. The strategy that he's exploiting in this case is a function of the brain called task switching, which is the brain's ability to switch attention from one thing to another. It's well documented in psychology research that when people do the same task over and over and over and over again, their speed will increase and their errors will decrease. Make them shift back and forth and they suddenly get both slower and worse at the tasks. Taking this and applying it to Jeopardy, if there's only two categories, like ends in Asian and British monarchs, it's both easier and faster for your brain to figure out each additional answer when you stick in the same category. You're in the groove, or on a roll. But James, of course, didn't do that. By constantly moving around the board, he triggered in his opponents what's called a switch cost, which in this case is the additional time and effort it takes the brain to process information when there has been a switch of some form. So James, whose entire training was all about switching topics, topics very quickly was much more adept and able to do this on the fly. But his opponents, who weren't trained to that gameplay style, were left holding the bag. They were left at a disadvantage and tripping over their own feet. So already James is not only playing the statistics of Jeopardy by choosing high value items at the bottom of the board, but he's also playing the metagame of Jeopardy by playing the other players, using the human brain's built-in weaknesses against his opponents. On top of all of that, whether it was intentional or not, James didn't just jump around. He looked like he was trying to do it as fast as possible. Before Alex Trebek was even done telling James his last answer was right, he usually had lined up what clue he was choosing next, and he'd spit it out as fast as possible. One example from game 23 of James's run after getting a question right, James called out his next choice as Sports 8 instead of the real name of the category. Let's go to that sports thing for 800. Maybe James just didn't want to say a category name as goofy as let's go to that sports thing for 800, but a much likelier explanation is that he's just trying to use a breakneck pace against his opponent. Opponents. He's switching, and he's switching quickly. Using this sort of strategy from the very first question, James was in the lead by over $8,000 on average after the first round. All those things combined make that player a force to be reckoned with, but James wasn't content with just that. He had one more card up his sleeve, a trump card that made him unbeatable. He bet what seemed like reckless amounts on all his daily doubles. He bet way larger amounts than almost anyone in the history of the show so that when he'd get a daily double right, his score would double, putting him so far in the lead that it was literally, literally impossible for any contestant to catch up with just the remaining dollar amounts on the board. Now here, James was also playing with an advantage. He stated that because of his job as a sports better, literally someone who is paid to place smart bets on sporting events and players, he's used to gambling with huge amounts of money. He said that for him, seeing a $60,000 wager doesn't phase him because he's become desensitized to numbers that large, where for most of us, we'd look at that number and see it as a down payment on a house or 60,000 single hamburgers at McDonald's. Just something that's way too precious to bet away on a whim. So he was the only one willing to make bets that big because he was psychologically primed to do it. Luckily for him though, that strategy doesn't just work psychologically, it also works out mathematically. Over James's 32 wins, he got to answer 75 of the 96 daily doubles, and he answered them correctly at a 94.7% accuracy rate. He almost never missed them, so frankly for him, there was much less risk to betting big. Odds were that no matter how much he wagered, he'd get the answer right. But even when James did miss the answer, the rest of his statistics indicated that he 
would be able to make a comeback. James was the first to buzz in to answer 58.3% of the time, which is pretty darn impressive when you consider that the other 41.7% was split amongst two other opponents. So on average, he was getting to answer more than double the number of questions of his other two opponents. And when James buzzed in, he wasn't likely to miss. His overall accuracy rate over the course of the run was a mind-boggling 97%. It can be hard to contextualize just how crazy that correct answer rate is, but remember when I mentioned Ken Jennings earlier, who won 74 consecutive Jeopardy games? He is the most famous game show player in history, and his accuracy rate was 91.7%, meaning that he missed questions about three times as often as James did. That's insane. Imagine the greatest player in any sport or game or other quantifiable contest, whether that's Muhammad Ali in boxing or Serena Williams in tennis or Grand Pooh Bear in video game speed running. Now imagine someone else coming along and making one third of the mistakes of the person considered to be the best of all time. That is crazy. Sure, it's just a difference of 91% to 97%, but that is a huge difference there. James just comes in and crushes the game with a level of knowledge that no one has ever seen before. But to sum up what that insane accuracy and buzz rate means in the context of a Jeopardy game, if James made a big bet on a daily double early on in the game and lost everything, based on his statistics, he was going to answer about six of the next ten clues correctly, whereas his opponent would only get one or two a piece. People who watched James knew that when he got a lead, he tended to keep it and expand it aggressively. But the data would also suggest that in the rare instances when he was coming from behind, he could make up a deficit quickly. So you can see how all the pieces of his strategy work together to make him a crazy difficult player to beat 32 times in a row. And that sort of record leads to James's biggest edge of all, intimidation. While he didn't step into his very first game with the reputation of being a Jeopardy wizard, it didn't take long for James's reputation as a high-scoring, big-betting, buzzer-swinging outlaw to be established. And part of the reason for that is that Jeopardy filmed several episodes in a day, meaning that the players that James would face on Friday got to watch him annihilate the poor saps from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday before diving into the deep end with him. And even when those players put up a fight, it didn't seem to make that big of a difference. Take it from Marshall Shelburne, who described playing against James like this, quote, my main emotion during the game was frustration. There were many, many times where I felt like I timed it just right, hit it right on the lights, and every single time he was one step ahead of me, end quote. Now, I'm not accusing any of James's opponents of intentionally giving up, but behavioral psychology would suggest that they were probably inclined to, and so Subliminally, to some extent, they might have been. The theory of learned helplessness says that when we experience repeated negative stimuli, such as getting beaten on the buzzer for the 12th time in a row, we eventually just accept our own powerlessness in the situation, and we stop attempting to avoid whatever negative stimulus that is. A rat trapped in a box where the floor is electrified every once in a while and has nowhere to escape, he just gives into it and he's like, well, guess I'm getting electrified this time. Sucks. Actually, it's a really sad thing for the mice. Same thing in a game of Jeopardy. The TLDR here is when you get smacked around in a game of Jeopardy for long enough and you see it happen to other people, you stop putting up that much of a fight. Don't take my word for it either. Alex Trebek has got me covered. After one particular record-setting game, Trebek apparently instructed James to look at the next contestants coming out of the audience and said, quote, look at them. They're going, oh poop, we have to face James next. If you can get everybody's favorite mild-mannered television trivia uncle to start dropping expletives, you know that you've won the intimidation game. None of of these things individually is going to guarantee a win. At best, betting big and switching categories and answering faster gives players small edges, but that's the thing about James. As a professional gambler, it's his job to recognize and exploit small edges. He knows that betting on a team that'll win 55% of the time is vastly superior to betting on a team that'll win 52% of the time, and that this edge will be magnified the more repetitions there are. And James kept repeating and repeating and repeating. So with all of this in mind, with the odds literally in James's favor and a massive winning streak under his belt and a massive amount of money in his pocket and a massive amount of knowledge in his brainy head of his, how did he lose? Did someone just get lucky? Or as many on the internet have suggested, did something fishy happen? James 
lives and works as a gambler in Vegas. And if there's one thing that happens in Vegas, it's that the house always wins. When you hit too many jackpots or win too many hands of blackjack at a casino, the only thing you can count on is a tap on the shoulder that's going to tell you you've played enough and it's time for you to take your betting somewhere else. The casino, or in our case, NBC, isn't in the game to lose money. And in the next episode, we'll be talking about all the ways they tried to intentionally oust James from the game. So don't touch that dial. Go grab your fix it in and your gold bond medicated powder and join us for part two of this theory where all questions will be answered. Just think of this as a multi-day commercial break that you can't fast forward through. In the meantime, though, I have a Jeopardy clue for you. Answer is, this is the best way to stay informed of all the uploads happening on this channel. What is subscribing and ringing the bell? Yes, oh my gosh, you're totally right. Final Jeopardy winner is you. You should ring that bell, hit subscribe, make sure you're notified of when part two of this theory happens, as well as all the other awesome theories that we have here on this channel. We really run the gamut of literally every topic that you could possibly cover, from YouTube web series to horror movies to Disney theories to Marvel superheroes. It's literally anything and everything goes here on the channel. So if you enjoyed this episode, you're going to like the next one and everything else we have coming. Hit that subscribe button. Help us reach the 10 million mark so we can get the glorified diamond paperweight. Film theory deserves it. And in the meantime, remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. And... Now here's a Jeopardy question for you. This is the best way to stay warm and stylish this winter. What is the new round of Game Theory merch? That is correct! I knew you were smart, James. Didn't let me down. And once you know it, Holiday Theory Wear is available right now below this video via our handy dandy merch link in the top line of the description. We've got everything from a Game Theory Switch case to a new version of one of our most popular items of all time, the hoodie dress for girls. Want to be comfy and cozy this winter? Snuggle up in our black and green lounge pants. Planning on heading out into the cold? Check out our flight jacket. It's one part hoodie and one part windbreaker. It's even got patches that you can swap around with your friends so you can make it a film theory and game theory jacket or just a gamer jacket or heck a game theory and jacksepticeye and markiplier hoodie or it could just be fnaf it's omni merch because we made it modular i'm just very excited about modular merch and hey did you really hate a certain theory like a lot of the star wars theories that end up wrong well you could do what stephanie did during the merch shoot and hit me with the box or you could take it out on the map pack collectible Tumblr. There's more too, like a t-shirt, an ugly Christmas sweater to wear to all your holiday parties, all of which are available right now. Just click the link below or go to creatorinc.com, I-N-K.com. Forget Black Friday, make it Theorist Friday. Quantities are limited though, so once they're gone, they're gone. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next time for Jeopardy Part 2, and remember, it's all just a th